nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But in this I see nothing but the blood of Jesus for my cleansing. This might be nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. my hope and peace nothing but the blood of Jesus this is all my righteousness nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus if there was ever a day where you had every reason to question God's plan where God's providence was nowhere to be seen if there was ever a moment to think that God has failed us and ask through desperation, God, what are you doing? If there was ever a moment where things seemed unfair, where suffering felt unjust, where it seemed like there was no hope in the future, if there was ever a day where you couldn't imagine what your future holds, that day was Good Friday. And tonight's Good Friday service recognizes that sometimes you don't know what the future holds. To recognize that God was still sovereign even on that day when it seemed like evil was victorious and darkness won. I'd like to welcome you to our Good Friday Tenebrae service. Tenebrae, of course, comes from Latin. It means darkness or shadows. And this sort of service has been practiced by the church since medieval times. Tenebrae is a prolonged, simple, silent meditation on Christ's suffering. If you're tuning in to our services for the very first time, I'd like to welcome you to Church Online. Uh, do please visit our website, goshen.church. There you'll find a lot of resources and announcements. If uh, you go to slash live uh, or info, let me just tell you, you'll find a lot of things about how we can connect with you to the church and help. But let me tell you, normally our services are not anything like this. They're full of joy and fellowship because we believe that God is sovereign, that Jesus rose from the dead, but this service is different. Tonight, might feel a little bit more like a funeral because tonight we remember the death of Christ we think about our sins 
We remember God's wrath. We mentally go down into the valley of the shadow of death. And as we do that tonight, we do it because, well, so that on Sunday when we celebrate the resurrection, the joy will be greater than our sorrow. Adam and Wisner have a very simple service plan with readings that will trace the story of Christ's passion and his suffering. We have really simple music, uh, nothing super special going on. The loudest sound in the room will be your voice is what I normally say, and that's a little complicated now, but I would encourage you at home to sing. Because I, I think that when you sing, it just resonates with your heart a little bit stronger. Tonight, though, the most important message will be you hearing the words of Scripture, portraying the emotions of Christ. And the power of silence and darkness should, should suggest the drama of this momentous event. The service really is supposed to start in light and end in darkness, but look, I, um, I have no control of how many lights you have on at your house. If you want this to work great, you can start turning them off slowly as the service goes on, but uh, you don't really have to do that. Please do this though. Follow along. Please do sing. This is probably not the best service to uh, get a lot of snacks, like, like you don't, don't get a, a lot of popcorn or anything. This is about recognizing the great darkness, the suffering, the injustice. And we do this so that two things happen. The first is that you recognize that even when you go through dark times, you need to know this. God is still sovereign. The second thing is that well, on Easter morning, if you go through the dark shadows, you will be so much more joyful because you see a light shining so much brighter. In the darkness. Usually on Good Friday I have to work pretty hard at telling you normally cheerful Goshen Church to uh, not talk to each other, right? It's really awkward normally, but uh, this whole online thing has made that a little bit easier. But uh, I'm not going to be in the chat rooms or the comments. Don't leave anything. Don't, don't comment. Don't text me right now. Uh, spend all your energy thinking about the darkness, thinking about the suffering, about the fear, about the loneliness, Think about the worry and the anxiety and the lack of hope that those early disciples felt on that day. As the service go on, ponder the depth of Christ's suffering and death and remember the cataclysmic nature of his sacrifice. So Father in heaven, I ask that as we all in our separate places contemplate the great love that you have for us. Can you give us hope as it sinks in how bad things were? Remind us of how good you are. And as we remember your love for us is shown in your suffering, through the work of the Holy Spirit, please show us the gravity of our sins, the seriousness of our separation from you, and can you renew life and faith and hope in us in the next days in a way that only you can. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Luke 22, 39 to 53. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? 
when Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee, O oh, the follies of sin, I resign my gracious Redeemer, my Savior art Thou. If ever I love Thee, my Jesus, tis now. Because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree, I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love my Jesus is now. I love thee in life, I will love thee in death, and praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath. And say when the death to lies cold on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the, ro the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow be of sin the double cure. Save from guilt and make me pure. Not the of my hands 
can fulfill our lost demands. Could my zeal no longer know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and Thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to that cross I cling. Naked come to Thee for dress. Helpless look to Thee for grace. Thou to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals who had hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. What a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sin to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemns he stood sealed my part with his blood hallelujah what a savior guilty vile and helpless we Spotless Lamb of God was He, full atone. Can it be? Hallelujah! What a Savior! Lifted up was He to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted I. Hallelujah, what a Savior. So this is normally the part of our Good Friday remembrance where we take the Lord's Supper. And typically, we let that speak for itself. And rather than having a message or a sermon, we just let scripture and song deliver the message. And it usually tonight crescendos in the communion, which is a powerful way of saying that we are together, we're the body of Christ, and 
Christ Jesus himself suffered and died for us out of love for us. Like that is what we normally do. But these are not normal times. And I think that for now, after consulting with some other Reformed Church leaders, we're better off theologically and practically just waiting to take the Lord's Supper until it can again be communion with our community gathered here in person because we are, right now we're apart. You all are in your homes. We have, honestly, we have, we have things to worry about. And to be honest, I, I don't want to speculate too much about where your head is. But let me say this. Right now, if you're worried about what's going on, if you're worried about the future, well, you are not unlike everyone else in the story of Good Friday on that night who didn't know what the future holds. And here's the thing. When most people don't know, you know what most of us do? Uh, actually, I don't know about you. Let me tell you what I do. I get glued to the news. And uh, I-, I confess, I've been almost obsessively uh, connecting with the numbers and the data, trying to watch the curve flatten. And my hope has become that this will end soon based on all the data. And I have, I- I've just been obsessed with this stuff, with the news, the latest developments, the statistics, the trends, looking for hope in the data. And um, in the last day or two, God has just been telling me something. And, and let me just say, dear brothers and sisters, maybe I shouldn't be looking for our safety or our doom in numbers or statistics or risk profiles. Risk profiles. One of my professor at Westminster wrote about this, and it sort of just snapped me out of it today. He um. He points out what you already know. And uh, if the first followers of Christ looked for safety or doom in the numbers or in the expectations, or if the first disciples were affixed to what looked like reality on the very first Good Friday, they would have no hope at all. They would have very little confidence and they would be rightly ruled by fear. One of the things that God does in Scripture so well is to turn our gaze somewhere else. Like, like read what Scripture says. Read read with me what faith tells us. These are some things that would have helped those first disciples. And I am convinced that they might help us today. Think about verses like this. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Think about that. Or or think about Psalm 124. Our help. Look at that. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Or Psalm 139. All the days are ordained for me. They were written in your book before one of them came to be. Proverbs 16, the lot is cast into the lap. In other words, like you may think you're rolling dice. It may seem like chance and randomness. But Proverbs says something that is hard to understand. It's every decision is from the Lord. Or Jesus in Matthew 10, are not two sparrows sold for a penny and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your faith. Father, or Romans 8, 28, for we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Or Colossians 1, and he, he's talking, of course, about the risen Christ. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Or Hebrews 1. I love this. He, this is talking about Jesus Christ, the Son. He is the radiance of the hope of glory and the exact resemblance of his nature and he holds the universe. Like, like think about that phrase. He upholds the universe. Like, like our God holds things together by the word of his 
power. And I know, it's Good Friday, and I'm skipping ahead, I'm spoiling things a bit, but I almost can't help thinking through this. Maybe it's just what my soul needs to hear. And I know, we, we, we can't move through the Passion Week too quickly, but this, this is true. Think about these words. Let these words soak into your soul. People of faith, we don't live by probabilities or chance. We're not just lucky or or experiencing serendipity. This is true about you. We live every single day under the loving, wise, sovereign rule of our Creator and Redeemer God. And the result of that is hope, which which steers clear of both naive optimism and resigned pessimism. You know, my, um, the year that I graduated from the seminary, one of my dear professors, Al Groves, was fighting through his diagnosis with cancer. And it, it just struck all of us. And he went to the best doctors he could find, and the doctors quoted him a... 85% chance, five-year survival rate with treatment, which, which he took. And uh, I, I remember him talking about it, and he said, I don't know about those numbers, 85%. He said, I'd say my odds are either 100% or 0%. And he said, it was, it was real. Like he's, he's talking about, like he's looking down the face of death. And I remember him saying, If the Lord wills, I'll be here in five years. If not, he said, I'll be with him in five years. And and rather than putting his hope in a relatively encouraging 85%, focusing on on the still substantial 15% risk, he entrusted himself 100%. To the one who would keep him safe, body and soul, no matter what was to come. You know, I think a lot about what the Reformed Church teaches based on Scripture. Like, think about the Heidelberg Catechism Q and A twenty seven, and you know, I I need to hear this right now, (laughs) and maybe it'll reassure you as well. The question is twenty seven is. What do you understand by the providence of God? And the Catechism says, providence is, and this is actually super relevant right now, Um, if you feel like everything's falling apart, providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God, which he upholds as with his hands, heaven and earth, and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things in fact come to us, not by chance. It's not serendipity, but it is from his fatherly hand. Nothing is by chance, the Catechism says, from Scripture. In fact, the the tragedy of Good Friday, it, it was all part of God's plan. In fact, everything in your life right now, it all comes to us by our Father's loving and wise hands. Another one of my mentors has been saying, like, like I love this, we didn't pick this pandemic, but God chose you to live at this point in history, this, this time, in these dark times, this is really true. Maybe God is calling you as a person or us as a church to stand up and shine the hope of Jesus brighter than ever before. Don't, don't live in these trying times unduly focused on impersonal probabilities, statistics, charts, or the news. Like, this is not a good foundation for true hope and reassurance. Like, I mean, sure, 
watch the news, follow the guidance of the government, health officials and all that. But don't forget to look toward your faithful and loving Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who holds you in the palm of his hand. And look to Jesus, whose nail-pierced hands are evidence, both of the fact that God's profound love for you and of the truth that God's providence is bigger than our greatest fears and recognizing that God can be trusted in good and in bad times. This is the news that we need to hear when we feel like we're living through Good Friday. So Father in heaven, can you bless your word to us? Even as we think about going through the valley of the shadow of death, can you help us to fear no evil? Because ultimately we recognize that you are with us. Father, I pray against this pandemic. Can you defeat the coronavirus? Can you bring us back to Bring us back to you in all this. Be with our country, be with those who are sick, be with those who are in health care, be with those who are worried about the economy and jobs. Father, can you, can you give us a resurrection that makes us all, Paul's, as a, as a culture, as a country, as a globe, and give you thanks. Father, in these dark times, we pray for resurrection. And we hope and expect for you to rise again. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame And best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to. by the world has wondrous attraction for me for the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary so I'll share it old rugged cold till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a Stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll share.
bed Then he'll call me someday To my home far away Where his glory forever I'll share So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it some was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find me in thine all in all. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change a leper's spot. The heart is Jesus paid full All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow And when before the In Him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, and my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid in full, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. Paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow 